All right. It is nothing but a packed house tonight. By the way, the, the speaker is for people listening in, not for you here in the room. So we've got to remember to talk up. Everyone hear me all right? Yes. No one ever has that problem. I'm an insanely loud guy. Uh, anyway, so glad to have you guys here. Thank you for coming. Um, we wanted to, well, we'll jump right into it. We want to try to provide as much uh, a bang for your, your brown bag buck here as we can. So we're going to try to cover as much content as we can. Um, maybe like the first time you guys talk, if you could just like quickly announce yourself, who you are, so that people know who you are. Uh, yes, I am Neil Jenks. I am a UX designer and I work for Software Technology Group. And along with all of these people except for one, I got to go to front conference. Uh, we're going to leave 10 minutes on the end for uh, Brent Schumann to be able to download some of his learnings from his uh, product management uh, scrum, blah, 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 scrum. certified, yeah, that thing, scrum certified scrum product owner, holy cow, that was way off. Anyway, he's going to share some learnings from that as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, you got your notes out, ready to rumble? No. <laughs> you ready to rumble anyway? Cheat off our notes. Okay. Uh, the first one that we're going to start with is starting with why. It seems like a, a big theme of the conference was... Uh, having a vision and distilling that vision. I'm thinking specifically here of uh, what uh, Wade Shear had to say at the beginning, which I thought was just a terrific talk. Uh, he talked about having a vision and then boiling that down to strategy and then going from strategy to objectives. But it's all got to start up there. I mean, if anyone in the room is familiar with Simon Sinek, then they know that uh, starting with the whys uh, is the important place to start as opposed to the hows or the whats. So uh, anyway, that's what he kind of was advocating. Um, the, the pyramid, if anyone wants to talk about the pyramid from Wade's thing, I thought that was interesting. You want to grab that one, Matt? I have that. Is, is, is anybody else? Uh, all right, uh, Matt Ashcroft, uh, UX designer um, with STG. Um, so he, he, defined, a, he def, um, defined a results pyramid, and at the, the bottom of the, uh, the, bottom of the, of the pyramid um, is experiences, and then it moves up to beliefs, and then it moves up to actions, and then the and then results was the was the was the pinnacle of that. Um, another thing, I I one of the takeaways that I had on that. Um, so I, so I guess that's a strategy for for how to get to how to achieve um, results in a successful product team. Um, that was one of his um, about uh, discussing the vision and, and and making that a thing. Um, this was Wade's uh, Wade's um, presentation was actually one of I noted every time I hear repetition of, of words, of phrases, um, I always like to no, note those when I start hearing those, because um, you'll start hearing that in, in some of the scenarios. And this was one of the first indications, and this is kind of a start with, start with why question. Um, this was one of four times that I heard, understand what the exact phrase, understand what success looks like. Um, I think one of that's one of the challenges of us as as, as technology experts is understanding what success looks like. Sometimes we create things that we don't, we don't really know why, why we're creating them, um, <laughs> whether that's in design or whether that's in development, or whether that's in pro as a product, um, starting with the end in mind, um, be, you know, starting with why, like, but understanding what that success is like and defining, defining that success. So, uh, you got one, Celestia? I do. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Celestia Garner. I am a business analyst solutions architect for STG. Um, so this particular talk that we've been discussing, uh, or speaker, Wade, um, was also one of my very favorites. He was the opening, opening speaker for the conference. Um, and he started out the beginning of his presentation with um, an analogy of uh, with, with talking about D-Day. Um, and World War II and, uh, and Normandy. And so he talked about the strategy and a lot, I mean, it's a military effort. We're in World War II. We're trying to end this thing. Um, and so a lot of strategy went into this. Top great minds are coming up with a strategy. They have these drop points on these maps. They've got so many soldiers that they're sending out. 
they, they do everything they can to make this a successful mission. They know how important it is and how much is on the line. Um, and then they get in there and they run into a bunch of issues. Um, the, the, it's super windy. There's a storm coming through. There's fog. They can't see the drop points. Um, a lot of factors come into play. They had to really um, get agile with what they were doing. And agile meaning they had to make adjustments on the fly. Um, when you look at where the soldiers actually dropped, most of them did not hit the drop marks that they were supposed to. That also meant that they dropped into a lot of enemy territory, places they shouldn't have been, other things. But they all knew the ultimate strategy, and they all knew the ultimate goal. They knew the plan, they knew where they needed to be, and they knew how to make those little tweaks at the end to make it a successful mission. And as we all know, it ended up being um, successful. So. Um, it, he compared that to um, UX, to technology and software and agile and user experience and um, product management and marketing and how, you know, when we're coming up with a, a technical solution, a lot of strategy can go into that. A lot of people spend a lot of time trying to solution and strategize and come up with a plan. But we also need to make sure that everybody knows the overall vision and goal of what we're trying to do. Um, they understand the success metrics um, of how, what a successful project is, and they're okay with making tweaks partway through the project or partway through the process. And um, as those of us who you know, are working in software projects, typically that aligns with the Agile methodology of software, of Agile and Scrum, of making those adjustments as they come out through a, throughout a project to come out with a successful product at the end that makes sense that is a success, that's successful, um, and it might not look exactly how it, they thought it would be, how the strategy, the map originally thought, but we come to that end successful product um, that is the best solution for our customers and our clients. So that's what I got out of that. I think just real quickly related to that is uh, something that Wade mentioned was we should be focusing on outcomes, not solutions. I mean, that's, uh, that, that's not quite in the, you know, starting with why thing, but anyway, focus on outcomes, not solutions. Uh, if the solutions don't lead to positive outcomes, don't lead to those successes, don't lead to positive vision, then it's, it's not going to be very good. All right, who else here? Uh, Mike Christoph, UX designer, STG. Uh, another thing upon what Wade talked about with leadership was being able to lead the product but not to direct the product or the project. To have faith in, in your, um, your teammates knowing that they can, if they, like Celestia said, they know the strategy, so trust them that they know what they're doing and don't micromanage. Hey, I've got one too. Uh, this is, I'm Brent Schumann, also a designer. Um, just, just barely not with STG anymore, but love STG. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, with the product owner certification that I got, I just wanted to touch on this vision again and, and being outcomes focused because when we write user stories, for, that will go on our backlog or user stories that will drive uh, creation of our products. Just like Neil said, they don't include the implementation details. When you leave it, um, when you clearly uh, communicate the pains of the users, their needs, the business needs in a user story at a high level, and then you delineate the high level outcomes, you give the teams the ability to create the best solution. And, and so often we, we don't, we don't do that right, and that's one thing we pra practiced and worked on in, our, in that product owner certification. Any thoughts for us before I pass the microphone over? Uh, no, okay, cool. <laughs> All right. And, and Brent, you need to limit your, you've got your special time. <laughs> you need to limit your time. Your what the heck, time. man? So exactly eight now. We are deducting so track your of that. ten minutes. Let's make sure we're keeping track. Uh, something that was said here uh, oh, about uh, leading your people, not directing your people. There was a really good quote uh, from Steve Jobs, again from Wade Shearer's talk. You don't hire great people to tell them what to do. You hire them so they can tell you what to do. I think one of the greatest, greatest uh, attributes of leadership is humility and realizing that you don't have any of the answers and giving the reins to other people. All right, let's see if we've uh, belabored that one enough. Yes, okay. On to the next topic. Building relationships. I noticed a lot of them about that. Uh, let's see here. Does anyone have any thoughts on that quickly so they don't hear me rustling to my notes too much here? One of the ones was the talk by, oh yeah, Lauren Treasure. Uh, she talked about uh, 
uh, there's a really common uh, Venn diagram that we use in the audience, and bear with me here because we're not using a slide today, but you've got your UX circle, you've got your PM circle, and you've got your dev circle, and the circles overlap, and in the middle is supposed to be your gold star, right, if you're using those three things together. That's okay, com yeah, uh, according to her. What we really should be shooting for are those three things, plus one more Venn diagram, which is marketing slash brand, science, and customer support. So in other words, we need to get outside of the regular silos that we're in and make sure, especially as UX professionals, that we are reaching out to all the various departments. Uh, thoughts on this one initially? Oh, Russ, okay, here we go. Russell Cheneau, STT UX designer. So uh, one that stood out to me was uh, Maggie Crowley's and uh, so I'll, uh, some of the thoughts I heard from other people after the conference was you know, a lot of these people are in these high roles where they have a lot of influence over the process already and uh, you know when you go there and you're you know just uh, you, you have a normal role on the team sometimes people felt a little disconnected from how do I apply, mm -hmm. you know, how do I actually make some changes. So what I liked about her, she's a director now, but when she told the story, it sounded like she was telling it from when she was a PM because uh, they started in a rough place. They, their team didn't have a lot of trust with the stakeholders. Uh, you know, they made some mistakes in the past. Uh, they, um, they were a bit disconnected, but they were recognizing that there were some things that needed to change. And she actually walked through, you know, and in a case study format. And all these are published, by the way, uh, all these talks. I, I recommend listening to her. She talks about how they went from, you know, that situation to being a uh, performant team that had the company's ear. I just thought it was interesting when she walked us through all that. Awesome. Uh, anyone have any thoughts tie in logically to him? Um, yeah, so let me see if I can get to If not, I got a cover okay. here. So yeah, so I mean, one of the, one of the big things with, um, I think, um, that I know a lot of them talked with, Kim Williams talked about ra radical, co radical collaboration, the concept of radical collaboration. Um, and she identified things like, first you have to know yourself, right? Um, and then know how you work, all that, that kind of stuff. And then know how your team works. Um, I, uh, like particularly, Neil and I are actually on the same project. Um, with we actually were two teams that were combined together um, eventually, and, and it's interesting because we have two completely different development teams, and the development teams have, they are a li living, breathing organism themselves. Like they have personalities, and they have thoughts, and they have, they have concepts, and, and some of, they have different challenges in, um, they have different things that they find important, and different things that they, um, that they value and they, and they want as a, um, as a team, and so, one, like I really identified with that about knowing how your team works and be able to go in and be able to um, really get in depth with them and build those relationships and, and know, oh, this particular team, when I'm talking to um, this development team, I need to know these are the, these are the personalities that I'm talking to. And, 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 the, and, I, and so then that way, and then the, this other team, this is the, how that team works. Um, and enjoying how, and enjoying the experience of the two different person, all the disparate pers personalities, and enjoying that, having that, having that experience. Um, and let me see what else she has on that because that's on a uh, second Strength and second differences page. was a big theme. Yeah, yeah, that yeah that's we that's true. Differences, and we should seek to unify differences by having a shared vision. Yeah, she's, she, and she says um, getting clarity, you know, clear roles. She said that while we have these, like, while we have these in part of building those relationships of having, um, knowing, uh, while we want to be collaborating, we want to, but also it comes into play of like what, um, what makes you, making sure you define roles and responsibilities. So that while we're collaborating, we enjoy that in the end, we do need to have roles and responsibilities that are defined. And she identified a RACI chart. I've, I've seen RACI charts before, and so I, that was kind of, I, I, I wrote it down, and basically a RACI chart um, is identifying, it's a matrix that you identify, first off, whether or not you're responsible, who's responsible for, for something, who's accountable for, for, for a piece in the project, um, who consults on that, um, and then finally, 
um, who, who's informed. Like for example, like a CEO might want to be, uh, might be an I, uh, you know, might have an, uh, have an, um, might have an I or an, a, 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 but might not be necessarily responsible for that or something like that. So you want to be able to understand what the roles of everyone is, so that you can, so that you can define how that as you're building those relationships. So, cool. any other people on that? <laughs> As I pass it, oh, Do no, you have something else on that one? Please, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I really, this is Celestia again. Um, so I, I also really liked Maggie's talk. Um, and what was I going, wait, I wasn't going to talk about Maggie's, which one were we just talking, was I just looking oh, at? Oh, we were talking about Kim Williams's. Yeah. Um, so she talked about uh, the book Strengths Finder. Um, and I worked on a project recently where they had the entire team read the Strengths Finder book. It's a smaller little book, um, easy read. But it's a self-assessment of um, where your strengths are, what motivates you, um, and just to learn more about the team. Um, our manager also had, uh, had her family do this. She had all of her kids read this book and do their own strengths finder and have a little family meeting on it as well, which I thought was an interesting um, uh, a take on that. Uh, but she did talk about doing personality tests with your teams, about 16 personality types, um, knowing yourself, knowing your team, and knowing your partners as well. Um, so, and uh, later on she talked about knowing your customer. So, you know, understand what motivates people, understand where people are coming from, their rewards, what, what they um, value. Things like that are important with teams and um, to have really high functioning, um, successful teams to really understand where everybody's coming from. After we had that session with that team and then we all shared afterward kind of where we lied and we did a couple different personality tests. And after that it really, um, you know, there were a couple of things where people are like, I don't really want to admit it, but this is kind of where I fall on this part. And, you know, when everybody else on the team was one way and then there's the one person who's like, well, this is actually how I feel about it. But ultimately it, it added um, an extra layer of trust with the team and a better le level of understanding on why people were working the way they were. So definitely understanding attitudes and um, personalities and strengths, all of those things are really important um, in teams and success. Awesome. What I like about that approach, Celestia, is you know we, we spend so much time talking about gaining empathy for our users. We don't spend any time talking about gaining empathy for the people we work with every day. And I think that that's, that's a great way to gain that kind of empathy. Uh, other thoughts about the relationship thing? Where are we at? Yes, Brent. Brent, the non front of this. <laughs> so I think uh, you know, one part of the Scrum framework is the, the retrospective at the end of the sprint. And I've seen teams where they really embrace that and they encourage people to really share. And other teams, they just kind of go through the, 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 go through the rigmarole and they don't, they don't really care and they don't really want to act on it and people really don't share because some personalities kind of squelch that, that uh, feeling. But anyway, I've, part of Scrum is that retrospective and, and I think it's the beneficial to, to, to do some of that team bonding and understanding and, and improvement. I have one more. One more? Yeah, please. So uh, in this one was from Nate Walkinshaw's, um, Nate Walkinshaw's um, talk. Uh, um, he said one of his things was um, basically know each other's world. So understand where, um, where you're from. And he, one of the things he was talking about is this, this idea of um, creating a shared language um, and creating a shared workflow and shared context so that everyone on the team knows what, when we're talking about different metrics or we're talking about, um, about, what's, uh, about what's happening, you, you are all talking. And it's basically so that you can relate and then you can have a safe place where you can feel like you can have that, radical, that you know, going back to Kim's, or you can have a ra that radical collaboration. And I think that's really hard. I think it's really hard, especially, to, it's about relinquishing control. And sometimes um, I know um, in, as experts in what we do, w relinquishing control is hard is a challenge. It's a massive challenge to relinquish control. Um, and, and, and so the idea of, of peering in, letting people peer into your process and peer into your, um, and I also know a lot of, especially a lot of designers, I don't know, um, have a lot of imposter syndrome. And so like the idea of like, if I peel back that onion and I peel back those layers and they, they see my process, they're going to be, uh, are you, is it going to be like the Wizard of Oz where I see uh, where I see, you know, 
the, you, there's, you go behind the curtain and there's nothing there or something like that. But really, it's really going back and having that colla collaboration and great, trying to get the best idea forward and the bre best concept, whether, wherever that comes from. Um, and that kind of thing. John, you f I feel like, John, I feel like you have a, you want to have a on John? Real, I, well, you're I'm behind, late, so, yeah, so, so let's sorry. bring some I, I, comments I, I, in. Is that, is that five minutes for me? I don't <laughs> yes. know what the, where the timer lands. Right now we're just talking about um, building relationships no, with I, the I was, topics that we're on. Thank so you. The, no, so, I wasn't uh, sure if you were here for that. I'm, I'm, I'm just, no, luckily I have a good, I have a, who are you? Oh, yeah, tell oh hi, I'm John uh, Van Orman. Uh, it's been um, several minutes since my last uh, minute of client work. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so one of the things that stood out to me, and unfortunately most of my thoughts kind of begin to branch, and you'll notice this, it's horrible to have a conversation with me for this very reason, but um, Wade Shear even opened up by talking about D-Day, and I don't know if you guys already yeah. covered that on some level, but to me it also led me to um, some of the concepts around that invasion and the success of that initiative, and that is um, Operation Mincemeat. Um, it, it, it got me thinking about the path of what a team does as it relates to this kind of ragtag group of people who look it up it's super awesome and kind of creepy at the same time. Um, essentially what happened was the Allies made up this character, gave him a background and a past and a story, and then launched him from a torpedo tube on a different beach near between Spain and Portugal, and it totally threw uh, the axis off the trail of where they would actually be. So he was supposedly a real lieutenant colonel, I think. And they found this body in the morgue. Like, it has this kind of eerie past. But you relate that to product, and we have to get to know our people. And we have to create these small teams to create to kind of create these weird solutions to problems that have never been solved. And in large organizations, sometimes that means going and sitting down next to the per to the, with the person next to you when you can't have a small team and you make these little relationships one-on-one -on -one where you talk about how you can solve a problem and you explore what pocket lint is, uh, which is, I, I believe a, coin, a phrase c coined during that operation where they basically like put stuff in his pocket to make him seem like a real human, like a picture of his wife and some orange thread. And like they gave him this history and that's what we do in large part as UX designers is we're building relationships. We find out who we're talking about. We find out who we're talking to. We create this story that can allow us to really create lasting solutions mm -hmm. and really lead people feeling like this thing is real and they can trust it and they can believe it. Not as a smoke screen, but as something that's, that, excuse me, is viable. Anyway, Sweet. that's what led me down the path. Right. Yeah, sure. So based on that relationship that you say, there we go. try to create it regardless, the army or if you want to create a little project. So if someone in the army has a rigid idea that way and doesn't want to go in that way, mm. if the other people at that time were to and the, that guy in the army or anything or situation in high level, whatever he said, that's it. Then how do you approach that? Okay, so let me just really quick restate so that we can get it recorded here. So it's about um, if, if someone in charge has a really limited vision of what the way they want things to be and you know that it's wrong or, you, you know, you want him to expand his vision, how can we help with that? Is that a good restate? Okay. Anyone have any thoughts on that, especially maybe thoughts from the, the front conference? Russ, you got one? I just wanted to start with, I think, I think a theme in there was don't be that guy. <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right, now someone can take the hard part. <laughs> Such a short. This is Mikey. I think it's it's empathy was was really uh, stressed a lot during that conference. Empathy of of your teammates, empathy of your user, and to to put yourself in their shoes and walk their walk and understand where they're coming from. So then that way you can talk to them and get their point of view and build that relationship of trust, and then break down their barriers. I got one too. Nate Walkinshaw said that data is the new bacon. And what he meant by that was is that if you're having a hard time selling somebody, especially a higher up, start with data. Give them lots of data about why this solution or this uh, would lead to an amazing outcome. Other thoughts on that one? This is a really good question. Cool. 
I, I, it feels like you may be experiencing that in your Maybe. personal life. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that for that person, empathy is really important because data is data. But if you can really feel that person and understand where he's coming from. And most of the tests yeah. like that in terms. Right. that's the kind of the situation the application goes down. Mm. Because maybe that guy is right. Maybe he chooses the right way. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't want to be open to other people helping him. In. He gets frustrated, sure. tired, and just reach the point can't do it. That's the you know, other thing that uh, sometimes I have a difficulty mm -hmm. to how to, I know that this is his baby or whatever, how do I approach it? I see some hope. I wanted to explain what not often this mm -hmm. It is very difficult. So well, I, I like the data as the new bacon approach. Sorry, I saw a couple other ones here. Uh, this way. So I, I, as you were as you were talking about that, I, I think. Do I need to say my name again? This is Matt. Um, um, so all right, I, I'm next to John here, um, and next to Celestia here. Um, okay, so so Maggie, um, I didn't get her last name. Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. Oh, that's why I couldn't find it. Um, she was with. She, um, she brought up something about how to improve teamwork. Um, and she identified some things. Um, she said, start with a shared vision. So create that work, go in with that person and say, okay, what's your vision of what we want to accomplish? Like, what do you, so that we can establish a ground rule, a ground basis for what we want. And then um, be honest about conflict. A conflict will arise. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a passionate person and conflict arises a lot with me and so a lot of it is like how to be honest about that and say hey I, like, I feel like things are getting intense here let's talk about this a little bit and then um, tools to be objective the data is the new or data I say it word um, is the new bacon you know um, and then and then when in doubt use humor um, which I try to to some levels of success um, but <laughs> But that, that, just those ideas of create, improving teamwork, how to you know, um, establish that shared vision and that kind of thing. So. Cool. All right. Uh, well, all right, Brad. Well, it, is, it is so cutting in on the time now. There you go. So uh, one, another core element of Scrum is that the team is accountable for the solution and you empower the team. And this kind of a situation uh, is is difficult, but I think you overcome it through all these things that you're saying and through showing success when you empower the team. And so you may not get it on this issue, but then when you can successfully identify a high-level outcome, propose an excellent solution to that person and, and they can see the, the expertise of the team in action and that it's better than their idea. Um, sometimes you can deliver that idea and another idea and, and let them see that as well. Okay. Well, we're kind of um, uh, we're up against time a little bit, but actually the next two points actually combine really well with each other: narrowing scope and backlog management. There's some like that, that was probably the biggest eyebrow-raising moments for me is when they were talking about backlog. Uh, I, I believe it was Nate Walkinshaw who said that if there's anything that's been in your backlog for longer than three months, you should chuck it. Delete it. Delete it. Don't even think about it again. Because if it's been sitting longer than that, why, do you, why are you still thinking about it? And that, uh, that funny comment someone posted, it was really like dramatic. It was something like to the lines of, please, please tell me you do not actually do this. You know, <laughs> like, like all, the, all the work that went into the research and, and uh, you know, all the, all the knowledge that's in there to have it deleted instead of like just tucked away in some other place. Yeah, don't archive it. Get rid of it is what he was yeah. advocating. And, and I think, and, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that both from the panel, both in terms of what you learned and then also how you feel about that, because that is kind of a controversial one. And it, it has a lot to do with, I think, being married to our, our ideas. You know, we, we have this amazing idea, we want to push it forward, so it's really, really hard to sign the divorce paper, so to speak, with that idea. And I think a big part of that is uh, backlog grooming. Uh, so yeah, uh, thoughts on either narrowing scope or backlog management from the panel here. Hi, I am still Celestia. Um, so also the only female on this panel, so you might be able to distinguish my voice from the yeah, others. Yeah, However, still going to say my name anyway. Yeah, so. All right. So. Um, 
Matt uh, talked, uh, he was from Bitly, um, gave a talk um, about the North Star. Um, and that was a great talk. And that kind of follows along a, a little bit with both of these. Um, but he talked about following the compass direction and not the star. So if you're looking at the star in the sky and when people were using that as a, a mode of, um, of uh, how to, how to, where to go and, you know, something to follow, they weren't literally mapping their path from here to that star in the galaxy. They were following, um, they were using that north star as a compass to show them the right direction to go. And so it, they t he talks uh, um, quite a bit about um, different design principles um, and roadmaps. Um, he talks about um, defining what is complicated. Um, so those are the things where there's a lot of unknown parts. So looking at what's unknown and complicated, and then looking at things that are complex, and those are things that are unknowns. Um, so anyway, he kind of was talking about the things that you know are complicated, the things that are unknowns are complex, and kind of the difference between complicated and complex um, issues as you're looking at the research and doing that. Um, he talked about coming up with the objectives, the why, uh, measurable key results, the what, um, the having concrete targets and the when, and um, current projects and how. So um, it was a really great presentation. He had a lot of visuals, which were really nice and helpful. We don't have those in this um, setting right now. But uh, he did talk a lot about, um, about the objectives and, um, and how to narrow the scope when you're starting out with a project and looking at and mapping these things out and then narrowing them down. Um, one of the other ones, really quick, since I still have the mic and they haven't stole it from me yet. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Taking all the things. Yeah. Um, Oh, I lost the next one that I was going to do. All right, I'll pass it on. I promise we'll give it back. Pass it on. It. Promise. Oh, that, that was, was Matt Strong, Matt Strong yeah. um, from Bitly. Uh, other thoughts on that one? Uh, just it, re really quick while I've got the mic. There was uh, something that was said by, oh, man. And then since we said it, no, I've lost it. Okay, Matt, Russ, I saw your hand. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to me. No, I, was, I was thinking about the whole 30-day backlog thing. Oh yeah, and, uh, three days, not three months. Thirty days? Uh, thirty days or three months. I can't remember what they were advocating. Both of them are very scary. Yeah, they're both really uh, scary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the point, the gist of it, uh, I was thinking about the terrifying statement he made and, <laughs> and uh, well, I was also thinking about like, you, you, know, what, you know, how might this be possible? Like how, how could that work? What benefits would it have? And, you know, uh, he expresses a lot of appreciation and trust for his guys. And, you know, his response basically came to, you know, if it's important enough and it comes back on, I know my guys can, can handle it. They can get the information again. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking that he's probably uh, demonstrating the kind of measures people like him take to stay focused on, you know, their main objectives. And, uh, and it means removing distractions. And that's just one way they do it. Yeah. Laser focus. Uh, okay, and that, that actually leads in really well to what I finally found, which was, this is from Thor. Yes, his name really is Thor Ernstson. Uh The Amazon CEO said, uh, one thing I love about customers is that they are divinely discontent. And what he meant by that is that as time goes by, like you showed a little graph, as time goes by, user expectations increase. I mean, think about how much we lost our minds in the early days of the internet with like chat applications, with ICQ and all those things. And now, if it isn't the equivalent of Slack, we're like, oh my gosh, why am I even using this? You know. Um, the power went out at our house for two hours yesterday. Like two hours. And it was like my kids were like it was the Stone Age. Like it was, it was literally. I can't go to sleep. And so it's true. Like this idea of this divine discontent, we, we, we grow to this, like, to the space where we, where we look with users on that. So, yeah. One of the developed tools, one created yeah. by yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the point of that, as far as the laser focus, is if you're going to laser focus on anything, 
laser focus on your customers, on the users. He says that they are, quote, maniacally focused on their customer. I even drew a picture of the Tasmanian devil on my notes because they are maniacally focused on that. And to do that, it is so important to test your assumptions. And I know that we say that all the time in the UX world, but it's so far beyond a platitude that it's ridiculous. No matter how smart, no matter how empathetic you are, your assumptions are always going to be wrong. So you've got to test them. Okay, other thoughts? Yes, John. Uh, Let's pass it on down here. Um, I also appreciated, uh, I believe it was also Matt who said you won't win any design awards, uh, right? He showed us the redesign of Bitly and said, you know, this didn't win any awards. I don't expect it to. And frankly, I don't really care. But this solved a problem. And let's talk through that problem. And I, I really respected that as far as both from a hiring, a, a applying, and a, a there are three facets that I have no words for, so I'll stop there. But from any position, if you are looking at someone else's work, without the context of the problem that they were just trying to solve, it does not matter how pretty it is. It does not matter if you like it. It matters what problem it was trying to solve, and did it do that? Because at the end of the day, those are the things that matter. And anything else, a lot of award-winning companies have gone under because they didn't solve a problem, so. He named out a few of those award-winning companies, too. Yeah. yeah, well, we won't mention them here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, this is Celestia again. Um, so, yeah, I also liked Thor, just to kind of go along with what Neil was saying, too. One of the last things that he talked about was throwing out your five-year plan and roadmap. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. In five years, you're not going to be hitting that. So it's okay to have like ideas and think through, but if you're having a five-year plan for where you're, com for as far as corporate goals um, and at more of a product project management um, scope, you shouldn't be planning out what your product is going to look like in five years um, because it will be different. You can have some ideas, but don't have a detailed roadmap of this. these 10 tracks are going to happen and they're going to start in Q3 of 2024 and this is what we're going to do in, in Q4 with this team. You know, don't, don't get stuck in those details of like detailed road mapping out that far ahead because um, things will change in five years. Um, I did want to talk really quick about um, Mark from Vivint. Um, his talk that he did, it was the last one on the last day, um, and it, he talked about the business value of design. And um, so he talked about um, his it, it, he talked some about his experience. He's currently at Vivint. He talked about some of the, his experience at Nike, um, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he talked about choosing uh, 10x or 10%. Go big or small iterations um, and design for emotion. Um, he talked about a pyramid. Um, so it was mapped to, mapped to the feature pyramid um, and use it for acceptance criteria. Um, and this got more into the product um, area of the conference. So he had this pyramid that is the bottom level of the pyramid, so four levels of a pyramid. So the, mo the thing you should be focusing on the most is that it's functional. The, the product that you're creating is a functional product. Um, and that's broken down into the tasks um, that go into a project. Next up from there is that it's reliable. Um, it, if it's not reliable, then you need to find something else. You need to either stop the project, stop that feature, go back and figure things out. It has to be reliable. Um, the, the third tier that he talked about was usable. Obviously, it has to be usable. Um, sometimes usable and UX um, sometimes can be looked at from the beginning of a project and they become kind of that bottom tier, the thing that gets looked at the most, where really making sure it's functional and reliable should be the most important parts of a product, and then the usable. It still has to be usable. That's still part of the pyramid and important, but it shouldn't be made the most important tier in that pyramid of things that you're looking at. And then the top one is the pleasurable delight feature. And talked about how it's always good to have something in there that adds value, something that has that delight factor 
to the users. That should be the smallest amount. Often the, the people who have a vision for a product, um, particularly higher up, they want this pyramid flipped. So they want that, that desirable, that delight, that, that big wow factor of what they want built in. That's what they want for the base. That's what they want. Most of the items, most of MVP, everything needs to be focused on that feature and then usability, then reliability, and then make, make sure it's functional. Just make sure it works. You know, but let's focus on this delight factor. And so he talked about how um, the perception can often be that, but we need to flip that to where um, it's still important um, and that's something that still needs to be a factor, uh, but it shouldn't be the most important thing that you look at when you're doing that. Awesome. All right. Over here. Yeah, so when he talked about that pyramid, um, he talked about how a, a good release is like, imagine, you know, this pyramid diagram and a skinny little sliver over here, he called it delivery, deliver the sliver. And yeah, so when, when you release, uh, it has to have, you know, pieces of all these different parts of the tiers. And uh, it reminded me of an article I read by Stephen P. Anderson years ago, um, where he was talking about uh, when you make a release, that it needs to have the right combination of features with it. You know, uh, sometimes we just think about one feature and releasing that feature, but sometimes that doesn't make sense by itself. Like there's other things that need to be with it in order to make it valuable. And I really, like the analogy stuck with me because he was talking about, you know, uh, mixing a cake and having all the right ingredients in there. You know, if you end up with this cake that had no sugar in it or you have something that had everything in there but it was still the soupy batter, you know, <laughs> you know, those things don't really deliver value in the end. Uh, but but the analogy of uh, the sliver, which was also used at a recent product hive. Um, I don't know if you guys heard that one, uh, but that was from uh, Rain Focus, I think it was, or one of the, re yeah, okay. And so, um, yeah, they, they talked about that too, delivering, you know, instead of one big giant wedding cake, they were releasing a bunch of little cupcakes. You know, each had, you know, some, you know, the cake is good, it's got the sugar in it, it has uh, some frosting to add sweetness, and then it's got some decoration to make it, you know, delightful. And uh, I don't know, I just, oh, I, I guess there's been a lot of cake analogies. I think a couple were <laughs> used. They were hungry when they were hungry. Yeah. Their <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's been described as a thin slice, also, I've heard that in other contexts, that goes all the way through the features. Yeah. The Deliver the sliver. Okay. So one really quick one, then we've got to move on to the last one. All right. So going back to that whole idea of like, because that really freaked me out, the idea of throwing out roadmap, uh, throwing out roadmaps, and especially if you've got larger, yeah, and backlog, yeah, and, and, and that like freaked me out, especially, and it was interesting because a lot of those were product-led team, like product, and a lot of, um, lot of organizations, like for example, um, the one, the one I'm deployed at right now, it's, it's, the product is not the focus. It's an, it's an intellectual property organization. And so the, the concept of, of, of that, I don't know how well that would speak to the higher, higher ups, but one of the things I was, I, that I identified as something that is one of the things that, how they do that, how they keep that, um, backlog management is, is a, is constant feedback loops. Yeah. Is being able to constantly go back and go, constantly talking to your users, constantly getting getting feedback, getting what you, so then that way, that's the things that you throw out of your backlog, like what Russell was saying was, like that will surface, and that information will surface, but if you, but if you don't have that constant feedback, then like you, you're not keep you 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 can't keep that you then you go back into the space of roadmap building and that kind of stuff. I think it's sure. sure. Most of the user preferred the application go to the production at that time they give you a lot of feedback. Uh -huh. Before it goes in we pushing the user, please test it to what you like you yeah one time. They will enter for example one way for feeling. But as soon as it goes to the production, pop up pop up pop feedback. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think uh, you were talking about you're talking about like um, really the product release space. Um, you have a lot. You have a little bit of feedback at the, at, in early stages, maybe through maybe initial discovery, and then then there's this kind of a dark mode until it releases, and then you have all this. That that was one of the things they talked about is not because they kept talking about shipping in small increments, like this idea uh, um, of of 
a f we have to have this massive feature uh, breaking it down into digestible parts so that you can so that you can release smaller features quicker so that you can get so you're 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 shrinking that that feedback loop quicker so that so that you don't so that you're so that it allows you to you're not shipping massive pieces you're shipping smaller pieces quicker um, is where they were what they were iter what they were talking about um, and just and and then so then that way you don't have this big ship that you're having to write oh we went this completely different way we've got to turn because we didn't we didn't get we didn't get the feedback the uh, in the right cadence because we shipped this massive we held off for months to release this massive feature or something like that so that was kind of how they work what they were talking about what with the workaround for that to do to be able to be that way so all right we got just a couple of minutes left for our last topic here uh, this last one has to do with working effectively collaborating well with designers and non designers uh, and I had a couple of uh, good thoughts on that one and of course I just flipped right past them Dang it, who's got a good one on this one? <laughs> I just had them all up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah, go ahead and then I come back to me. Come back to me. I haven't got it yet. I formulated part of a thought. <laughs> I just, uh, so Emily Campbell, I just wanted to, you know, for anyone who wasn't able to attend, uh, she showed uh, the result of some study they did about how design brings business value. And they, um, and so I just wanted to, bring up what it was called and you know what it's about so you guys can look it up so um, a big theme in there was design maturity um, which is a combination of practices people and platforms and the correlation that has to business value so that you can look that up it's free online it's called uh, the new design frontier as, uh, by Envision so cool very good way to start. The one that I had found was just another one from Lauren Treasure. She talked about the way that her organization works and they have what she calls the core CX team and if you're unfamiliar with that it just means customer experience. And then there's also a plus CX team. On the core team they have stuff like uh, UX managers, the front-end developers, other you know, UX people. And then the plus CX team it's finance, operations, uh, marketing, research, and it is intended that they work together. There are several ways that they can do that. Some that she mentioned were that uh, both of those cores are invited to the scrum meetings, uh, that they're all part of the same quarterly planning, that they all share and contribute to the same key indicators, uh, and that they're all just involved with each other on Slack. Slack is awesome. I love Slack. Okay. Uh, other thoughts on that one, collaborating with uh, designers and non-designers? John, come on down. Um, another thought that I appreciated from also from Emily uh, was that when you level up in an organization, when you get promoted, when you shift teams, to take the prior learning with you. And it's such a simple thing, but I think sometimes we forget the frustrations of being on the phone, you know, in a prior job when we were just getting started professionally and the challenges of trying to sell something door to door or, or through other means. We forget some of those things that make up who we are and why we take some of the positions that we do and have the opinions that we do, but instead to take all of those things with you so that you can relate to the people that you're, you're frustrated or, or challenged with, so that you can learn from or have insights that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. I really appreciated that insight. All right, we can, we can pee on Brent's time just a little. Oh, you're good, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on this one? In this, in this oh, sure, yeah, please. Yeah. Honestly, I, I feel like my discussion is better within this discussion because it's okay. just another point of reference, right? Uh, so that was one thing I brought to this Scrum uh, product owner certification was how does design fit in to this Scrum framework? And so I peppered the, the teacher, Rod Klar, with, with questions about, well, when does the design occur? And this is my process. And, and, and I, I was looking for a certain answer for Scrum to tell me it's here and not here and you're doing it wrong. So I could come back and say, I'm doing it this way and it's right. Uh, and what he said was, Scrum is thin. It's meant to be added upon. And so I think that was, that was good. And, and, and so we should work with our teams, do the design, get everyone's feedback, collaborate, give them opportunities to give feedback early, 
uh, review prototypes together, talk about concepts and, and ideas with the developers so they can suggest the solution. Um, but Scrum is thin and, and we, can, we can add on top of it. That's cool. I like that. Scrum is thin. That's, that's my sound bite for today. Uh, cool. Other thoughts uh, about uh, collaborating with designers and non-designers that you picked up from front? Wow. Do we tap the group? To do it. To do it, yes. I think what that was, and again, that was another big theme, was to break down silos. Uh, the, a huge job of the UX designer is to get out there and to talk to everyone, to attempt to become an expert at everything, to get down there and to mop with the guy who's mopping the floors. Uh, you know, we're, We are attempting to do everything for this company and thus to be empathetic with everyone and thus to provide, especially for the user, uh, the, the best value possible. Okay, so Brent, a few other things you wanted to say? Yeah. All right. Do you think? Should we give everybody questions for everybody? Yeah. Let's leave a few minutes at the end for some questions. That'd yeah. be great. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate SDG's focus on certifications, and it's not something I would have probably done had they not, you know, taken this uh, uh, this point of emphasis as a company. And so I appreciate the support also of being able to go to this certification. And uh, for me, I I was looking for a better understanding of some standard frameworks. You know, I, I've been on product teams for lots of years, uh, and Scrum was a word that people throw around, and you probably know that th these industry words, and, and they become associated with complicated frameworks that, that you think are, feel like there's something uh, mystical and complex about them. So I wanted to go and understand at a deeper level so that I could demystify that Scrum framework, and, and it really is. Uh, not very complicated, right? You have, this is a little visual and you can't see it, but, but there's a backlog and you populate that backlog. And a lot of what I do as a designer is to make sure that we're, we're creating the right stories and, and then we're working with the teams to, to create um, specifications for those stories. But sprint planning uh, and how do you do that well? And then the third one is, is navigating through the sprint and adapting and, and uh, so, it's not really complicated, and that, that was good for me to hear. Um, some other things that I thought were interesting, uh, Rod Klar is the person who um, gave the, the training. I did it in Draper just uh, last month. But uh, he said traditional product project management is associated with waterfall, not, not Scrum or Agile. Um, so he said capacity planning, that's project management. Uh, the burn down chart might be more project management. Uh, he said tools like JIRA or Team Foundation Server, you know, TFS, they um, impose process. Scrum does not endorse a tool. Uh, and when I say impose process, is the there's lots of fields to enter. Uh, there's a lot of things to think about. And there's these charts and these tracking things. And, and we lose track of understanding the user's needs and then prioritizing those needs and then working in that order. So it's something that um, I'm thinking a lot more about. A couple of things that I, I wanted to address immediately when, when I went through the, the training was a practice that I see is that our teams, when they have a sprint planning meeting, they each person says, I want to do this task. They estimate that task specifically, just that person, uh, they give an estimate and they build up this whole backlog of tasks in the sprint planning. So each person takes a load of tasks. And then throughout the sprint, each person pays attention to their tasks. And Scrum will tell you, or Kanban, or these other uh, methodologies will say, don't do that. Estimate as a team so that there's a shared understanding of how big that thing is. And then pull down during the sprint. You populate the sprint with the right amount of story points, not per person, per team. And then you pull down the, the next highest priority item. And the teams that I work on do it individually. People care about their plate. And then we end up at the end of the sprint without that shared accountability as a team. So that's something that, given the opportunity, I will, I will I, and I did talk to some of the managers in our groups, but uh, it's something I will care more about in the future is, is trying to take advantage of the queuing theory. The, the efficiency when everybody's focused on the main goal and pulling down things one at a time in the priority order. That was a big takeaway for me. And then, um, and that's all that I'm going to say because <laughs> I think I've interjected 
uh, points that I think uh, align with what we were talking about, and I appreciate awesome. the time. And uh, maybe we have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah. So five minutes for questions. There are uh, questions about things uh, that you've just heard, or just other things you'd like to. You're curious that we may have learned about. Yes. Yeah. So back to the throw things out if it's uh, you know 30 days or whatever. What if what if there are like known business requirements that you know that we'll need to get to? Would you still like throw them out? Good question. All right, panel. What do you think? Write a new one. Go fresh. Write a new. Yeah. <laughs> Just the proverbial it depends, I suppose. So part of Agile is, you know, making adjustments. Um, so as a business analyst slash UX person, <laughs> um, so, it, you know, the backlog typically has the higher up, a backlog should be organized in priority. And so the higher up something is on a backlog, um, the more detail it will have up until you've got the things that will be in the next sprint that will have the most current detail. Um, and so when doing that, um, it's good to write those user stories, particularly the ones lower on your backlog. Um, to add a couple of details if you have them, but it's important to really work on adding specific details and clarifications to those requirements one or two sprints ahead of development. That's when you should be actually doing, writing those requirements and defining them. So you can have still a backlog of things you know have to be done. Um, they're not saying throw all that all out. It's more if you've written a detailed user story or, or requirements, you know, requirements for a feature, um, and it's been sitting in your backlog for six months or a year, you're not going to pull that into a sprint. That is going to have to be reviewed, um, made sure that it's still current and relevant before it's pulled into a sprint. So it may get pulled up higher once it's in that, you know, next couple of sprint zone on the backlog. That's when it's going to be reevaluated, add more detail, you know, look at it with a fresh set of eyes, maybe have a different person take a look at the requirements to, to work on that. Um, so it's not completely throw out the backlog, I would say, although they did suggest that. Um, but uh, you know, don't go off of requirements and things that were, or, you know, products or details or designs even that were scoped out long periods of time in advance. Make sure that things are still fresh and get that good review um, and detail added before you put that, bring that into a sprint. Other thoughts on that one? Oh, this way, yes. I, I think, too, uh, a product is always evolving. So I think one of the, the spirits of that sentiment also surrounded when you create solutions for needs and then you learn about related things, those solutions shift. And so leaving priorities in tents and to me, honestly, dreams in a backlog of things to accomplish makes perfect sense. But then saying, hey, we have this story that's a year old, <laughs> let's throw it in. I've recently done that. The designs were totally different. Everything, like it totally screeched, like we came to a screeching halt. There was fire. It was all, it was, it all went downhill. But at the end of the day, I think that's the, that's the intent is, are you applying the most recent learning, understanding and thinking to the things that you are now prioritizing to do? And that to me too creates a sentiment of value in every role. The devs, the designers, the FAs, whoever it is, don't then feel like, oh, we're just checking off a box. But no, we're providing value to this problem that we understand. And we now understand these facets that we learned yesterday. And that's awesome. We can now apply them. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Good thoughts, team. I don't know if that helps at all. No, no, no. There's some thoughts. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't know. Uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question, if anyone else has one. Wow. We like solved every puzzle for you. Anyway, we, we certainly deeply appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you for your support. Uh, we, we will have this recorded and we'll you know, make sure that we send out a link to everyone, right Jennifer, I'm assuming? And please feel free to share that link with anyone who may be curious, who may be able to benefit from this information. And obviously if they, if they have any kind of questions about what we learn, we're not shy about talking about this stuff. This is, this is what we love to do. We love talking about these sorts of things. So. Uh, feel free to, ref, uh, you know, refer them my way or from any of our ways. Neil, I'm assuming that's that not too presumptuous. It'd be worth saying all of the talks are on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, golly. Yeah. Thank you. All of those front talks are on YouTube. You don't even have to pay to go to the conference. Just go and check them out yourself. You can see how yeah. honest we were with our. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we could have.
<laughs> find out what happened to Missy the Schnauzer. Mm -hmm. Missy the Schnauzer. That's right. Oh, we yeah, didn't even just, talk about this. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Tune in next week. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Attempt to turn this off here. Yeah, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, yeah, I'm